This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a 30-day trial and one free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. If I could go back, you know, six years ago and know that actually what I needed to do was ask to open my er marriage and to live in separate houses and to not present Mm -hmm. normatively as a couple and do all this couple centric kind of settler family presentation to the world. But I didn't know that, right? Like I totally didn't know that that's what was going on. Um, and so it's, but it, but being a solo person now, it's easier for me, I recognize, than to open a long-term marriage. I have a lot of sympathy for how difficult that must be. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself or learn more about non-monogamy then you've come to the right place i'm jace i'm emily and i'm dedeker and this is the multi-amory podcast On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking with author and professor Kim Tallbear about settler sexuality. So Dedeker is a huge fan of her work, and so I'm going to let her do the introduction. Yeah, I'm really excited about today. Um, so Kim Tallbear is an associate professor, faculty of Native Studies, University of Alberta, and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience, and Environment. Dr. Tallbear is the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science, and she's also the author of The Critical Polyamorist blog. She's a regular commentator in U.S., Canadian, and U.K. media outlets on issues related to Indigenous peoples, science, and technology. She's a citizen of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate. Yeah, so you've been a fan of Kim's for quite a while, yeah, right? Yeah, long time, long time. Yeah, so we're very excited to finally have her on the show to talk about all that stuff. Well, Kim, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We're really excited to talk to you. Thanks for inviting me. I have to say, like, I am fangirling a tiny bit because I've been following your work for a while and <laughs> I've just been like, oh my God, you're such a good writer. And I just love the way that you express your thoughts in a way that's both very academic and accessible, I find, um, which I think is kind of hard, especially for someone who's in your position and like doing the work that you do. And you recently, you gave the keynote speech at Solo Polycon, the most recent Solo Polycon. Um, And part of your talk centered on this concept of settler sexuality being this structure that a lot of our relationships adhere to, whether we're conscious of it or not. And can you give us and our listeners just a brief rundown of what exactly you refer to when you're talking about settler sexuality? Sure. And I'm glad to hear I'm accessible because that you never know right? <laughs> an academic. I, I feel like I'm accessible, but uh-huh. I'm not. So that's good to hear. Definitely. Um, so settler sexuality is a term that uh, Scott Morganson, who is a kind of queer theorist at Queens University, um, I think is made uh, really more popular in the academic literature. And so I've learned a lot by reading Scott and other both indigenous and non indigenous queer theorists, he's non indigenous. Um, but he and I wish I had his definition in front of me. Basically, though, the way that I think about it in terms of what I've learned is that it's the imposition of this uh, kind of idea of sexual modernity that sort of arises in the late 19th, early 20th century as settler states. So uh, particularly the US and Canada are um, developing as nations. There's a very kind of intense moment of development happening mm-hmm. there right after the Indian Wars and all of this and the, and the Indian land and native land is being taken and kind of divided up into individual allotments and settlers are moving farther and farther west. So th- the way that these nation states have sort of promoted sexuality, marriage and um, private property all as a bundle have been really central to, mm-hmm. to the development of the nation state. Now, people tend to think about our sexuality, it, particularly I think non monogamists often sort of push back against normative forms of sexuality. And they often attribute them more to religion, and I think not mm. enough to the state, but it's not only the church that was imposing these kinds of ideas. It really it was very much the state and academic uh, disciplines, you have the term homosexual actually defined before heterosexual gets defined because the state mm. and its mm. health authorities and um, psychology 
psychologists were attempting to monitor and make people comply with these emerging sexual norms. And those emerging right. sexual norms really are tied up with the state and private property and regulating and controlling people. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about settler sexuality. Mm. Got it. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting definition. Um, and I... Yeah. Something I wanted to ask, too, to kind of clarify on that a little bit more. So I feel like, gosh, maybe over the past two or three years, I feel like I've seen a fair number of articles, especially within the non-monogamy world, pop up that talk about um, essentially like colonial sexuality or about decolonizing mm -hmm. relationships, things like that. And I've heard both like this term became very popular and that concept became very popular. And at the same time, I heard some sort of um, criticism of that saying, well, actually you're kind of trying to use this to mean something different or the idea that we could decolonize relationships isn't even possible. I was just curious is because to me, like settler and colonizer sound very similar. And I wondered, mm -hmm. are those terms related? Are they, oh, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, what's the connection between those two things? If you know more about that than I do. Sure. And I, I'll come back to something else about settler sexuality, I should have said. Yeah, in Canada, we tend to, especially in the academy, we tend to use the word settler a lot. Uh, in the US, mm. it's much less common to use that mm. term. In fact, a lot of um, people in the US that I've talked to think it sounds too polite, um, <laughs> that we should say invader or something like that. But it doesn't uh. sound polite in Canada. And people don't, there are people here who don't like that term say any better than the term white. And mm. there's a big debate going on as to who you identify as a settler and who you don't. But yes, it's those who came with colonizing power right and and in that colonial moment and their descendants and then there is a big discussion about who you know are, are people of color settlers the that's the one of the things that gets debated you know many people would say no many of them are not right, right. Um, so then we can come back to decolonial sexualities in a minute. But the other thing I was going to say is when you're thinking about settler sexuality, um, another key part of that is to be a good, productive, normal citizen. And what is it to be a productive citizen? It's to reproduce. It's to have biological children. So that's how settler sexuality becomes heterosexual and heteronormative. But you've got people mm. like Scott Morganson and other queer theorists saying, yes, but now we have homonormativity. We have gay people trying to, to fit into these ideas of what's a good, productive citizen, you know, um, having children being good homeowners, trying to get all the things that they need to get access to the full array of rights that citizens are supposed to have. And our sexuality has been deeply tied up with what it is to be a good citizen, our, our relationship to private property. So it's not only straights that get included in settler sexuality, although it certainly has been much for a much longer time, straights have been privileged in that. But increasingly, we have what we would call homonormativity as well. And, and um, all of this is about our relationships and our family styles and our relationships to property supporting the state. Right. I, I wanted to jump on, you mentioned the productive citizen specifically, that it's not just about being a good citizen, it's about being a productive citizen. And mm -hmm. it is interesting that, of course, reproduction is wrapped up in that. But I also see it's kind of this sense of, you know, the sex that you're having, even, it, you know, it also has to be productive and not for pleasure, necessarily, uh, you know, yeah. that like your relationships and your sex, you know, because it's all about maximizing efficiency, maximizing what you're producing, which means minimizing that, time that you're spent, you know, goofing off and having pleasure, essentially. That does seem rather religious, though, in nature to me. I mean, I'm probably the least <laughs> equipped person to talk about religion here. But still, <laughs> it, it, from what I know, that does seem kind of the narrative that sex should be strictly for reproduction. Um, when one looks at it from like, a very biblical standpoint, I guess and not for pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's religion is certainly plays a part in this. But you can see that it, it's uh, the, the three parties that I look at as heavily regulating our sexuality are the church, and the state, and um, science. And the church, mm. the state and science have all been overwhelmingly run by straight white men in the West, right? Yeah. And so it's always straight white men who are who are telling us what it is to be sexually norm normal. And science has tried to define that, right? The states defined it and the churches defined it, and they all work together, even though sometimes they fight between themselves and act like they're separate. <laughs> as an indigenous <laughs> thinker, I don't see those institutions as, as separate as they might mm. see themselves, because they were all used again as a bundle to institute um, these kind of settler cultural norms and standards, they all work together. 
Well, that's interesting, actually. I think it's funny because, Emily, you brought up like, oh, I think I'm the least qualified person um, to talk about religion because the thing is that like both myself and Jace were raised evangelical Christian and then Emily Mm. was raised atheist. But, Mm. Emily, you've commented on the fact that even though you were raised atheist, there's a lot of cultural norms around sexuality and relationships Mm -hmm. that you still internalized, even not having basically anything to do with religion in your upbringing. Sure, and and clearly that's just simply the way in which I was raised, the way in which people tend to be raised, I think, in a Western society, that like sex is for a certain thing or it's for people that you're in love with and that, you know, you shouldn't be doing it otherwise, Mm -hmm. even though obviously the three of us, you know, don't exactly do that or, or, you know, think of sex in a, in a different way, not, not so strictly uh, for biological purposes or Mm -hmm. just because you have to be in love with someone in order to want it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess just to follow up on the question about settler sexuality, um, you mentioned mm-hmm. this just briefly that there's debate about, you know, who, who are settlers and who isn't, mm-hmm. um, is this something where, you know, if you're a white person, you're just screwed in this respect and you, <laughs> you know, like what's, what does that, what does that mean? What's that debate look like? Well, so people talk about, uh, so people that are coming here under duress, right, like refugees or asylum seekers, you know, no matter what color they are, you probably wouldn't call them a settler, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there was a debate, there, there are people are very unwilling to call, say, African Americans who are descended from enslaved people settlers, right? Their ancestors were brought here forcibly. But I'll give you a good example of how this doesn't just only break down along the lines of race. You would most people who deal with uh, the settler terminology in the academy would never call somebody like Michelle Obama a settler, right? But Barack Obama, <laughs> hmm. I would say you could make a good argument that because his mom was a middle class white anthropologist and his father was a relatively privileged immigrant from, I think, Kenya who came over for education. Pretty textbook definition of a settler. Yet we would we would define Barack Obama as African American and Michelle Obama as African American, but they have very different genealogies in terms of how their ancestors came to North America, right? And right. so that that's just an example of how you can't just substitute it for white people all of the time. Although mm. And, and of course, there are people who might come to code as white, who we would say came also came under direct. Anyway, it's it is a term that again, we're pretty comfortable using in Canada, but it's just not really taken off in the US. And I don't know if right. that's, that's because there is a greater history of, of slavery down there. And it's mm. just more complicated. I'm not sure, but people don't tend to be very comfortable with it down there. From, from my perspective, I don't run around worrying about who to identify as a settler as an individual. What I talk and write about is the imposition of settler colonial institutions and cultures and authorities. And all of us are capable of, of upholding that. And this is one of the reasons I'm really writing strongly against state sanctioned marriage. There's plenty of native people who buy into state sanctioned marriage, right? There's plenty of us who buy into private property now. And it's very hard to extract ourselves from the settler colonial kind of institutions. It's not just an individual choice to decolonize. Right. Um, but I do tend to want to focus on the structures more than individuals in, mm. in my work. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. And yeah. that makes a lot of sense for yeah. having these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, something that we touched on briefly also was that you mentioned in your writings that even non-traditional relationships or people who are homosexual, um, queer sexualities, they can still uphold these like settler sexuality constructs. Mm -hmm. So how do you really see that manifesting? Um, Is that narrative changing or do you see it still kind of upholding in the same way that it has been for many years? Well, you know, the way that I would use the word queer is the way that my uh, friend and colleague Angie Willie would use the word queer. She wrote the book on doing monogamy. Um, She says to be queer is to be against the state. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think probably just because one is not straight, that one is queer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, I personally, and the theorists that I read would probably make a difference between, you know, queer isn't all encompassing of all non normative sexualities, I think it really does involve a critique of the state. And this is one of the things that this is why I started reading so much queer theory as an indigenous theorist. There are so many queer thinkers out there that have the same critiques of how science and the church and the state have have marginalized our bodies, marginalized our communities, used us as these kind of 
raw, raw materials for research and for experimentation. And so when I got into graduate school, and I saw that queer theorists were particularly making the same critiques of science that I made as an indigenous woman, that's when I really started to read their stuff. And I thought we need to be at the same conversational table. And also the way that they they tend to try to do kinship differently, because a lot of queer folks have been ostracized from their families right. of birth, right? And they, they've right. learned how to make family. Right. Um, there's a lot in common with indigenous ways of kin making there. And so that's why I'm so in conversation with them. So that's how I use the word queer. Yeah. No, that's thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Because that's honestly, that's a very different definition of queer than I've ever heard before. Mm. And that I feel like most people that I know use so that that is really useful yeah. to. Yeah, I guess this is why academic papers tend to start out by being like, let's define some terms that we're going to use. Yeah. So I'm going to do a uh, something that most writers probably dislike, and that's, I'm going to quote you to yourself. Um, (laughs) So in your keynote speech from Solo Polycon, you said, um, many of us, uh, referring to um, the Dakota, I believe, you said, many of us continue to live in extended family where the legally married couple is not central, where children are raised in community, and where households often spill over beyond nuclear family and across generations. Can we not then also imagine sexual intimacies outside of settler family structures? I know we already have them. Can we name and measure them without using settler sex and family forms as reference points? Uh, I thought that was a fantastic question, and I wanted to ask you that question. (laughs) Can Can we measure them and talk about them without everything having to be in reference to some sort of settler sexuality, some of sort of state sanctioned sexuality that we have now? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. This is I'm I'm trying to do work that is um, focusing on webs of relation and being in relation versus the kinds of categories that we usually invoke. So we talk about being straight, or we talk about being gay or queer, we talk about being uh, a, you know, a wife or a girlfriend or whatever, whatever our categories are. And instead of identifying ourselves biologically or socially, I would like us to think about in ter- more fluid terms. Um, and I think one of the ways we can do that is to is to get away from these kinds of definitive ideas of who we are as if we were born that way, or even if we're hard social constructionists, and we think we were socialized that way. What if we just simply have, if we look at the way that we are relating in particular instances and with whom we're relating, and I relate to my daughter, I relate to my other biological family members, I relate to lovers, I relate to friends, sometimes it's always not clear who's a friend and who's a mm-hmm. lover, right? I relate to non humans, you know, I I'm, I'm a, the prairie is really important to me. The sky is important to me. There are people to whom their animals are important to them. You know, I'm not one of those people that has pets and things like that. But, but I, I do want us to begin to think more about what's the particular intimacy that we are having in that particular moment. And of mm-hmm. course, it should always be a consensual <laughs> intimacy, right? right. Um, mm-hmm. But, but that's what I, that's what I try to think about. I try to think about this web of relations and take us out of these hard categories into this kind of spatial metaphor where I'm thinking about where am I on the web? Whom am I relating to? And how am I relating to them? Um, and that might sometimes involve a conjoining of bodies that could fall under this definition of sex. But I'm trying to find other ways to talk about that and think about that. First, and this is also uh, one of the, the groups that I'm really interested in talking to are a- asexual people, people who mm-hmm. define as asexual. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of liberation to be had and in, in getting away from thinking in terms of this is sex and this is not Gosh, sex, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, and just thinking more in terms of how are we being intimate? And how are we trying to be appropriately and consensually intimate? And, you know, maybe we don't have to define that as sex, even when it involves acts like that sometimes. I don't right. know if that's too abstract, but no, that's fantastic. No, I love it's it. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. To, to kind of further go with this question, I think that something I've noticed when, um, you know, when non-traditional relationship type people are trying to find, like trying to get out of these sort of traditional labels of girlfriend or like this one's a partner because I have sex with them and this person's a friend because I don't. When they're trying to get away from that, I have noticed that Unfortunately, I feel like something that can happen is looking to um, other cultures and then kind of ends up like, I'm well, I'm going to try to appropriate some of these ideas mm-hmm. or some mm-hmm. of these other concepts that we've had. And I think that's, it seems like we have such a desire to 
have words to describe the types of relations a we label. have. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. and it's so hard. I think that I think we all struggle with this a lot because a lot of what you're saying sounds a lot like relationship anarchy. Mm-hmm. This idea yeah. of yeah. <laughs> rather than you put on a label and now you get this whole set of things that comes with it that each thing you're picking out sort of a la carte as it were. Like, well, mm-hmm. this relationship's going to have this thing in it and this thing and not mm-hmm. this other thing and this thing rather than just like, well, I have one label, so I have to have everything that goes with it. But it's it does become so hard to not have those labels, to mm-hmm. not have those words. Yeah, my, my co-parent is actually a professor at the University of Virginia, and he studies, he reads more of the anarchy literature than I do. And he said, actually, there's a book out, which I haven't gotten yet, that where this uh, archaeologist talks about some of the indigenous communities in California having actually been sort of organized anarchists is what he would call it. So mm-hmm. I do think there might mm-hmm. be some overlap. And that's that would be an interesting area to look at. Um, and I it's it might be why my sort of core values about relationships and relations, which I do feel that I've inherited from my Dakota upbringing, despite all the colonization, I think I think some kind of fundamental ideas about relations came through. Um, it, it might be why I have such resonance when I hear about what relationship anarchists think and do, you know, mm-hmm. that it, it makes a lot more sense to me. And I probably when I have time to dig deeper down into those conversations in literature, I will probably begin to identify more with that than polyamory, but I'm loath to take a term and ascribe it to myself when I haven't done the intellectual work I need to do right. to make sure that I understand what I'm talking about. And so right, right. it's why I still more call myself a polyamorist. But yeah, mm. I think um, I think there's probably a lot there in relationship anarchy that resonates with what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, it makes sense. And you know, anytime we've had conversations about relationship anarchy on this show in the past, like we always have to give credit to the fact that at least you know where the term was coined was out of a queer community, you know, Mm -hmm. and like you're saying, it makes sense because it's, you know, a lot of queer people are the ones who have to, who often, again, are like cut off from their families of origin and are kind of forced to like, well, I got to start from scratch here, figuring out what is family, what is partnership, what is friendship, where do those things intersect and how do I move forward from here? And I think this is actually a great segue to my question, which is that in your writings, you know, you have talked about the fact that, our traditional notions of the monogamous couple or of the nuclear family that uh, you specifically use the phrase, they have a hard time containing and often sustaining the complexity of relationships that we as human beings actually need or seek or feel in our lives. And you've also touched on the fact that, uh, you know, for you that you see specifically like solo polyamory or maybe things like relationship anarchy holding the most promise for challenging these constructs of couple centrism, for instance, and giving space for people to have a variety of relationships that sustain them in their social network. However, I think what I've found personally is that even regardless of the type of romantic or sexual or non-sexual relationships that you choose to have, I feel like people still have a hard time wrapping their head around just the fact that we need a complexity and variety of relationships, you know? Like, I think we're still, at least the way that I was growing up, I I was so taught that, like, you know, once you find your soulmate, you're good. That's all you need. (laughs) That's all you need, you know? Just, like, put all your eggs in that that basket, you know? Like, put all your energy towards trying to find that, because once you find that, then you're going to be good. You know, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter about your friends or your family, you know, then you're going to be good. And, I'm wondering, like, do you see a path forward for even getting people to understand, like, oh, it's not just about finding this one person. It is about this, like, wide tapestry of relationships that we all need as human beings. Um, you know, I I do feel not super hopeful about broader society sometimes, you know, because you look mm-hmm. at how we're inundated by all this couple centricity, right? It's mm-hmm. in every song every Mm -hmm. film, you know, every novel. Um, But where I have hope is, again, just looking at my own community where, you know, as I've written, the couple just didn't get that much play. Um, You know, aunties and grandparents and uncles and cousins, everybody was so important um, in that that kind of broader network of the way that people supported each other. And a lot of people who come from extended family kind of cultures where people still live in extended family will will understand that, I think. 
But still, despite the fact that we actually did a really great job of living in these extended kin networks and not privileging the couple, we were we were still, in a sense, stigmatized by the by the dominant society, right? Like as if we were failing at good families. And this is why we've had such a um, problem with Indigenous children being stolen from their families in both Canada and the US and being forcibly put into boarding schools in the US and they call them residential schools in Canada. I mean, you had, you know, thousands and thousands of children forcibly taken from their families because our families were not considered um, healthy and normative, right? And they weren't right. considered capable of raising those children. Um, right. So th that's kind of the world that I come from. But so it's it's that kind of history, but I also still have hope just in the way that we live. I, would, I wish we would stop stigmatizing ourselves. I wish we would um, do... And we, we do, we do both, right? Like we, we both, I think, value our extended uh, kinship networks. Um, and we, and, but we also then still kind of um, can't completely get away from these, these dominant standards that we're subjected to. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I so feel I don't know like if that's an answer. Yeah, no, that is definitely an answer. I mean, so we, uh, you know, part of our Patreon community is this like kind of closed like Facebook discussion group. And, I feel like we see that all the time of, again, people like just people expressing how hard it is to break away from the structures that have mm. been imposed on us from day one, yeah. whether that yeah. is about wanting something that's polyamorous, mm. or if it's about something about like just wanting to be able to prioritize your best friend relationship over your boyfriend or, mm. right. or to be able to co-parent as with, much as, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or being able to co-parent with a friend rather than with a lover. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like people, it's definitely caused a lot of pain the way that people struggle mm -hmm. against it. But then, like you said, I think part of it is also a lot of self self stigmatizing as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I, you know, I, I get really frustrated sometimes with the coming up against these walls, every way you turn, when you try to do something outside the norm, it feels like you're always hitting a wall. Yeah. And I, I do get really frustrated. Um, but on the other hand, I have so much more freedom than most people, I think, because I'm an academic and academics do tend to even if they're a bunch of monogamists, you know, <laughs> running around, they still I, I live in a world in which people understand that it's you question dominant ideas all the time. And that's completely normal. Um, uh, but it's definitely been a challenge for me in in terms of the other relationships that I have, because I, you know, we're, we don't live in a world of academics, I don't tend to date people like that, and having to deal with all of the restrictions that they have in their lives, right. And most people in my age, I'm 49, most people in my age group, they don't get to have the kind of freedom to make the kinds of decisions that I can make, they can't be out in the way that I'm out. And that has really, it's been really frustrating for me um, mm -hmm. to have to look at how they have to deal with families they can't be out to, with children that they can't be out to, right? Yeah. With having to curtail their non-monogamous practice and go back to being monogamous or being in the closet or something. It's, um, it, it's really, it's hard. And yeah. I have a lot of sympathy for people, I guess is my point. I mean, I, while I sometimes do get frustrated, I have a lot of sympathy because I know most people aren't as privileged as I am to make this kind of decision to live this way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's something we definitely talked about amongst ourselves on the podcast that it's like, obviously, not everyone has a long running podcast about non traditional relationships. Yeah, so not like, everyone can be out. You don't. Yeah. yeah, not everyone can be out. And you also you don't have quite uh, that uh, icebreaker on a first date when you're talking about what you do <laughs> to, <laughs> to like start to signal kind of what your values are around relationships. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had a, a question for the end, but I was thinking maybe we could do this now. Um, cause since you kind of segued into it, would that be okay, okay. Emily? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, when, when talking about these things about like significant social change, trying to move away from couple privilege or from mononormativity or, um, you know, sort of this, uh, obsession with state sanctioned marriage, it, it can be hard to, do that and to talk about that in a way that people can come along with you. So, you know, for example, when we talk about some of the problems inherent in very hierarchical polyamory, it seems like the people who are in those types of relationships, they're kind of faced with this struggle. Either mm -hmm. I accept that a large portion of my identity is based on these roles and values. And, and now all of a sudden I'm like, shit, I, I'm doing something wrong. I'm, I'm upholding something bad. 
or to go the other way and to sort of justify it and defend it and be like, well, no, you've got to be wrong for some reason. I was curious, have you found a similar kind of situation where, and I have sympathy for it, right? I get that these people are like, how do I take this? How do I go with this? I was curious if you've had a similar thing, a similar type of reaction. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of that, I think, in, in my age group. And I have noticed, you know, I, again, I try to stick to the structural analyses all the time. And I have noticed sometimes if I come in to like at Solo Polycon, it was great. I was really pleasantly surprised when I gave that keynote. That wasn't a largely academic audience. But there were so many people there that I think overlap with relationship anarchy who've thought critically about the state who think critically about property. So my keynote was really well received there. And I had great questions and conversations. It was one of the best experiences I've had speaking to a non academic audience and really laying on a heavy structural analysis. Most non academics are really not into a heavy structural analysis. And I found this on various Facebook pages, for example, dealing with <laughs> polyamory, people get defensive. Yeah. Um, Interesting. E- even when I feel like I'm trying to keep it at a structural level and not an individual level, which I do have so much sympathy for. I mean, half the people that I've dated, I've gotten broken up with because it, there's it's never even between these long term married couples, right, right? Who want to open their marriage? It's and I've dated mostly straight men, right? It's either the the wife wants it more, or the husband wants it more, and it's that doesn't work. You know, it's only been about twenty percent of the time where both people in the couple who've opened their marriage came to it equally. Um, and so I'm always suffering the collateral damage of people not being able to to work against the structure. And I've, right. I I learned um, a few years ago that I'm just not going to cast blame on people and I'm not going to resent people for that, that, it, that I realize how hard it is to work against that structure and they're mm-hmm. trying as hard as they can. And again, you know, people aren't going to lose their job and their children. You know, this, this is kind of what it comes down to sometimes, right? Right. Yeah. And then for others, they just can't get out of that mindset, you know? Yeah, it is It is definitely a different thing, like with the mindset thing, because I think that was also something that I ran up against once I started like working with people as a coach is that it's like so many people would come to me being like, I'm totally down with this whole, you know, dumping hierarchy and all like I see all the problems with hierarchical structure. And I really want to live my life and create my relationships in such a way that don't, you know, stick to the strict hierarchy. Um, but I've also been married and co-parenting with this person for 20 years. Like, how do I do this? How do I, like, I can't just like throw that out the window, you know? And, and so again, it's that same thing where it's like, I can't tell people like, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta throw it all on its head and you gotta get rid of, you know, completely change everything you've been doing for the last 20 years that yeah, it's, yeah. Well, and it's easier for me um, being a, a solo person. I mean, I left my marriage before I realized that this is what I needed to do. I thought, I thought that it just wasn't the right marriage for me. Right. Um, and then soon after, because if I could go back, you know, six years ago and know that actually what I needed to do was ask to open my er- marriage and to live in separate houses and to not present mm-hmm. normatively as a couple and do all this couple centric kind of settler family presentation to the world. But I didn't know that, right? Like, I totally didn't know that that's what mm. was going on. Um, and so it's but it but being a solo person now, it's easier for me, I recognize than to open a long term marriage, I have a lot of sympathy for how difficult that must be. So before we get back to the interview with Kim Talbear, we wanted to take a moment to talk about how you can join our amazing exclusive community that has formed around our Patreon. And the way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash multiamory and choose an amount that you want to contribute every month to support this podcast, to help us keep growing this, to help get this message out there to people. Um, And as part of that, you get to be part of our exclusive Patreon community. So at the $5 a month level and up, we have a private invite-only Facebook group that people have some amazing discussions as part of. We also have our privately hosted discourse server, which is a different platform for those of you who don't want to be on Facebook or just want to have another option of a place to discuss, um, where you can have conversations about some of these things or about non-monogamy or polyamory in a space where people where you don't first need to explain what it is, you can actually get to the heart of what's going on in your life. And um, if you want to be part of that, again, going to patreon.com slash multiamory is the place to do it. Uh, We also have like video discussion groups once a month, um, as well as um, episodes that come out a day early and don't have any ad breaks in them, as well as bonus content at the ends of a lot of those episodes. 
So anyway, if you want to find out about the different tiers and how you can get all of that at patreon.com slash multiamory, you can read about all those, view some more of our stuff, and we hope to see you there. And something you can do completely for free is go to iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. Um, It's awesome because it helps us come up higher in search results if people are searching for polyamorous podcasts or uh, relationship podcasts or sexuality and health. Um, If you write us a review, that helps us get higher in search results when people are looking for podcasts like ours. So it's really awesome. Um, And plus, it makes us feel great. (laughs) It shows us that we're actually doing something worthwhile over here and that uh, people are appreciating what we're doing. And so we appreciate you back when you do Mm -hmm. that for us. So again, go to iTunes and or Stitcher and or Stitcher <laughs> and uh, write us a little review. We do have some people who've done both. Yeah, actually. that's true. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Please do both if you and can. We, if we you do want. also, we read every single review. Like we do see it. Yes. Yeah. So. And occasionally cry about them yes. because they're so touching. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Exactly. But good tears, not bad tears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We do happy <laughs> cries. Happy oh cries God. over the best reviews, really. Yeah. Yes. Right. Totally. And our sponsor for this week's episode is Audible. Um, so Audible is a huge, huge, huge database of all different kinds of audiobooks that you can listen to. So uh, if you're a regular podcast listener, you probably enjoy this kind of media. If you have a long <laughs> commute, or if you got to go to the laundromat, or, you know, basically, if you really enjoy listening to this kind of media, then Audible is probably a good thing for you to mm-hmm. check out. So if you go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory, you can get a 30-day trial totally for free. It'll include a credit for a free audiobook. The way the subscription works is you get a credit for an audiobook every single month. Um, and uh, even if you don't continue the trial, you keep the audiobook and it still helps support our show. So again, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory and give it a try. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, we just wanted to mention again that we have a new podcast that just came out, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago now uh, called Drunk Bible Study. If you want to hear a podcast that's totally different from this one, where the three of us are going to work our way through reading the entire Bible, uh, it's going to take us many, many years to do it. Uh, But we're going to read through the entire (laughs) thing while drinking and just kind of joking around and talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's not a show about religion per se it's just about trying to understand this book that's influenced so much of the world and having a good time and goofing around while we do it so if you want to join us for that we would love it also it would be incredibly helpful for us right now during the early stage of that show if you could go and write us a review for that on itunes or on stitcher Um, it helps us to show up like in that new and noteworthy category we'll help more You know, other people who don't already know the three of us from this show will help other people to find that show. And um, we really appreciate your support. So if you could just take a moment to do that. Also, you know, maybe you wrote a review for Multiamory on iTunes like three years ago. And you're like, man, I wish I could write another review for them. Well, now's your chance (laughs) to go to Drunk Bible Study, look that one up and uh, that uh, and leave us a review there. So we really appreciate that. Uh, And with that, let's get back to the interview. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, about it, kind of the current time in which we're living, because it seems it, maybe it's settled down slightly, but uh, it definitely the Me Too movement and toxic masculinity and all of this stuff, it, it reminded me or it brought up uh, things when I was when I was reading um, about settler sexuality from you and just that there was potentially a connection between the two and just this idea that relationships are sort of this entitlement thing and that couple centric centricity sort of is like an entitlement for sex or relationship or like a a specific structure or anything. And it made me think that perhaps like people talking about the me too movement, talking about the way in which, uh, femmes or, or women are treated, um, and just sort of changing that narrative that perhaps it makes way a bit for the narrative around the way in which we do relationships, that that narrative can also change as well. And I don't know, I, I was curious to hear your thoughts about that, because I, it sounded as though perhaps you were hesitant and didn't really think that that much maybe will change. Um, 
but I know that things have been disrupted currently in this in this state that we're in. And so I was kind of wondering about what you thought about that. What I think about me too? Well, it more just do you think that it is a way in which people can start moving forward and thinking about relationships, thinking about the way in which uh, women have been, I guess, systematically treated over the years by men, uh, for example. Um, and because I, I kind of see it all in a similar fashion, obviously that's been happening for a long, long time, but I do see a connection between what you speak of and what you write about and sort of what's happening right now and, and the disruption and the change. You know, I mean, so I, I think guess, that's, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, I haven't actually thought enough probably about the connection between what the me too moments going to generate in terms of shifts in yeah. the way that people do relationships. I think it's really important um, that women are supporting each other right now um, in being so vocal about those. I mean, we all have these me too stories, right? And, yeah. You know, there's many more that are going to come out. I mean, every time I listen to these, I think about all the stories I'm not really willing to share yet publicly for for very good reasons. And um, so not nothing surprises me that people come out with. Um, but I don't know yet how that's going to if that's going to translate into um, shifting norms around relationships. I mean, I, I guess I would assume so. What I do notice is among younger indigenous feminists, because these are the people that I've talked to most um, indigenous feminists and queer and two-spirit people, I do notice um, how much less younger people are just willing to put up with the BS that my mm. generation put up with. And they're sure. not willing to be quiet. And I think that's like, um, really inspiring. I don't mean to like put it all on young people. That's terrible that people do that, right? Oh, the young are going to save us because we're leaving them <laughs> this like crap world, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, but, but they've clearly shown that <laughs> they have a lot of, of spirit currently. I mean, it is... Yeah, a lot has been happening around the young people and I think um, they're in our current they're leading, situation. They're leading us ethically and conceptually to places that I think yeah. maybe some of us that are older can follow. Yeah. But yeah. 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 You, yeah, well, I feel yeah. like it's it's an at least it was an interesting I see that at least it has brought light to this idea of like you know, of entitlement over the bodies of certain people that some people hold over the bodies exactly. of certain other people. Um, yeah. And yeah. And I, I don't know. I just, I, like, I guess my whole thing as all of this has been coming to light is just hoping, like just really, really hoping that it doesn't all just kind of like, like that the rage machine doesn't just kind of settle like it does so often on the internet, you know, that there's some kind of like lasting opening up change moving forward here. At least that's what I always think of. I think the willingness to call out abusive behavior, bef and I don't want to just say like it, call it out publicly. I'm searching for other words that are actually going back to my culture. Um, the the willing because we had a we had a tradition, and I actually heard that this happened behind the scenes at Standing Rock, but people didn't talk about it as much publicly because you know they wanted to keep internal dynamics internal. But there was um, a calling to account. That's a better term. Mm -hmm. There were Indigenous women there calling men to account who were acting in wow. abusive ways, and it didn't make it publicly, and it didn't need to make it. Pu it didn't need to be. Nobody needed to know about those the, because Indigenous women were taking care of it, you mm -hmm. know. And so, and I see me too. I think as a, as in women in general calling men to account. And I think that's yeah. a really important thing that a lot of indigenous communities do. And I think the broader society needs to do that. And I guess that's how I would uh, frame that versus saying it's calling out on social media, I would, you know, you need to call people to account. And part of that is, um, and there's a debate going on around this, actually, too, right? Some people are talking about, I can't remember the term that they're using, um, about when you call people to account, you give um, men ways to sort of redeem themselves. And other people are mm -hmm. saying, no, you know, I don't want to go there yet. You know, I don't feel safe enough to go there. So there was the, these kinds of active conversations going on or, among young feminists about how to call people account and then what you do about it. Yeah. We also had a tradition in, in our in among my people of casting people out who did irredeemable damage in a community, you know, so there's, right. <laughs> there's all kinds wow. of things we're talking about now about about how to and I think these conversations are great. So I, I think that has fundamentally changed. And I don't think we're just going to go back to not talking about these things anymore. Mm. I do think there has at least been that shift whether that's going to translate into real changes in relationships, you know, that might be a multi-generational project, but yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember the context where this was, but in um, I, I have heard the term calling in being mm-hmm. used as opposed to calling out um, right. with the idea being, and we talked about this a little bit on our episode recently about online arguments, mm-hmm. um, but this idea that calling out can sometimes end up having a certain like performative aspect to it, mm-hmm. um, especially with the other people who will jump in to like yeah. support this will sometimes be like, oh, I'm going to talk so much shit about this person who someone said did a bad thing because then somehow I'm not bad, you know, kind Mm, of there's a performative aspect to it. Whereas calling in sounds kind of more like what you were talking about of like within our community, we're going to come in and talk about this and, and, you know, see if there's a way for this person to redeem themselves or not. And really Mm -hmm. have the focus be on education rather than on kind of a, I don't know, a public shaming or something like that. I'm going to hop on that though. Sorry, just because I also want to bring up like the, but then the other side of that conversation is like how much of calling in is trying to protect someone who's an abuser, Mm -hmm. you know, and like trying Mm -hmm. to protect someone's feelings. And so there's, I've also seen that conversation of like, of course there is also some value to public shaming as well, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so it is just kind of definitely a nuanced conversation, but sorry to step on you, Kim. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think probably all of those strategies are important at different times. So, mm-hmm. mm. yeah. Um, I'm going to, uh, the next question we have here is a little bit of a change of direction. Uh, okay. So in one of your articles, this was, um, gosh, I'm blanking on which one this was, uh, but I'll I'll just quote you to yourself again. Um, okay. You said, uh that we fetishize the couple, making it stand at the heart of love and family, which are actually the product of much more complex social biological relations. And um, I think this word fetishize is really interesting because I know that within a lot of these conversations that we have or that I have with non-monogamous people or people as part of the kink community or other things that fetish is another one of these ones like queer, I guess, that I feel like in certain contexts can have a slightly different definition. Uh, And so I was curious about how you were using it here. uh, And then I might have some more questions after that, but I was just curious if you could talk about that. They must, they must be related. So how would you define it? um, And, you know, like kink communities, how would you define fetish? Well, so within the kink community, fetish has sort of taken on a slightly different meaning where Mm -hmm. fetish and kink almost can be used interchangeably when used as a noun to mean Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of a thing that I'm into that might not be normal, you know, Mm -hmm. that might not be normative. And I realize that's a very different definition than what fetish was originally meant to mean. And so that's why I wanted to bring it up because, you know, people will talk about, Oh, you know, my fetish is for, uh, I don't know, latex or whatever. Well, I feel like that's a little bit more the traditional meaning of like, I'm obsessed over an object. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. I feel like people will say like, oh, my fetish is, um, you know, uh, I don't know, animal role play or something like that. Right, a particular role play, yeah. Yeah. Right, that it's more of a particular thing I'm into, which is a little bit different than the initial meaning. So I was just curious about how you were using it in this context. Well, so I'm taking the word uh, fetishization from its use um, in commodity fetishism, which Mm -hmm. Marx talked about, and then gene fetishism, which my PhD advisor, Donna Haraway, talked about, who's drawing on Marx. And so uh, I wrote about gene fetishism in in my book, Native American DNA, and that is um, the collapsing of elaborate sets of social relations over time and across bodies down to the molecular structure into the idea of a DNA marker. So these these ideas of Native American DNA, they come to signify this kind of, um, that's what it is to be Native American. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look at what created what constitutes a Native American, it's not it's not just the molecules. I mean, it's not that those things aren't don't matter at any level. But there's all these sets of social relations that are that occur across the tribe and the clan and the family and they occur over time, they get embedded in your body. This is what it means when I talk about I and others talk about 
uh, things being biosocial. I'm not just a social constructionist. I believe that our body comes to embody physical things in the world. Our biology changes in response to social structures. Um, and so when I talk about the couple getting fetishized, I'm talking about that That's that couple, they come to stand as like kind of the core and the center of, of the family and that whole unit. But there's but in my culture, and I think for a lot of us, it's not just about it's that man and that woman, or now it can be same sex couples. But but who are all of the people that help constitute that family, you know, mm -hmm. even for people who consider themselves, I think, very nuclear family and couple centric, you don't get to exist in a vacuum, there's a whole set of social relations that are helping support you. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember what I and, and if I think into kink as well, I wonder if that fetish actually also embodies a bunch of social relations. But it just as you end up focusing on that particular scene or that particular object. But of course, it's so much more than that, right? Right. That is that is that is creating and constituting desire and and the interactions that are happening around that object or that scene or that role. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that's where that term fetish comes into play there as well. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, I it was interesting because I, I looked up the definition when I uh -huh. was coming up with this question when I was reading one of your articles and the definition that I looked up was interesting. So the first definition it had was kind of what we we're talking about, right? It's mm -hmm. it's um. It says a, a sexual desire in which gratification is linked to an abnormal degree to a particular object. To an abnormal degree, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. Right. So there's whatever, there's problematic <laughs> things in, in that whole yeah. thing. But but I think that's sort of the definition that, that I think most of us are familiar with. What was interesting is the second definition here is an inanimate object worshipped for its supposed magical powers or because oh. it's believed to be inhabited by a spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That definition of it. So that oh, was, that was really that. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. that there may have also been sort of a religious or spiritual practice yeah. that that word was also associated with. Well, and that would apply to the to the way that uh, Native American DNA gets taken up, right? Or I think mm -hmm. the way that the couple gets up. These are things that are both held up and lionized as being these important kinds of goals that people have, you know, they become, they do become magical in some sense. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah, were, I guess it, we were just talking about that. Yeah, that I this idea of like once I become a couple, or once I find my soulmate, or once I get that p particular relationship format, it does have the magic to like solve all my problems, <laughs> essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or it, it it in itself is magical enough, like to sustain us. Like I don't know. I guess that just ties to that whole narrative we've been taught since we've been very young by most of our like movies and TV shows and things like that. Well, I think I think that actually. Sorry, this is sort of blowing my mind here a little bit thinking about this, but um, something that we've talked about a lot is the over romanticization of romance. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of thinking of romance as something very magical and that has mm -hmm. more, that has meaning that exists outside of what actually is there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if we were to look at that definition of fetish and applying it to a couple, for example, I definitely see this thing where people will prioritize preserving a relationship over the happiness or well-being of anyone actually involved in the relationship. Mm. Right? Like yeah. the way that we, yeah. you know, the people who say like, well, you should never get divorced or who try to make mm -hmm. that more difficult mm -hmm. or that's not something you can do. It's this idea that somehow the the relationship of the couple or the marriage itself is the thing that is magical mm -hmm. or has meaning and not the people who are actually in it. Mm. Yeah, you um, just answered the question, your own question. <laughs> gosh, sorry, I had to... <laughs> that was good. That was good. You had to get there on your own. I had to get there, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah, fantastic. Um, I've, I've heard also people theorize that monogamy itself might be a fetish, that that could be a way of thinking about monogamy. I thought that was an interesting one, but we don't have mm -hmm. to get into all that. Like that we culturally fetishize <laughs> that, perhaps. Right, I think, I think it's trying to make the argument that that at our nature, people wouldn't be monogamous and we can choose to do it if we want, but that that's sort of like a fetish too. It's like, well, I'm choosing to enforce a particular type of relationship limitations or structure onto it. I don't know. It's, it's a theory I've heard out there, mm -hmm. but yeah. I thought of it because it's using that word fetish mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. to try to, to try to look at something sort of in reverse of how we normally do. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, this has been just a really interesting discussion. I feel like we've gone to all kinds of different territories here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I could definitely sit here, Kim, and like pick your brain for hours and hours and hours, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to ask um, 
Where can people find more about you and about your work? Well, so my blog, criticalpolyamorous.com, although I've been doing more academic writing lately, so mm-hmm. I haven't been updating it every month like I should. Um, so I also have a new chapter out in a book that just came out last month. The book is called Making Kin, Not Population. And it is on Prickly Paradigm Press, which is part of the University of Chicago Press. And I have a chapter on there in there on settler sex and family. So mm-hmm. in fact, certain parts of my blogs uh, were drafted and then kind of informed that chapter. Yes. Um, I've got a lot of YouTube talks. I guess I give a lot of talks and people put, put me up on YouTube. So quick Google <laughs> and you'll see my talks. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, I think that's what I've been doing. Oh, and then the other thing is I'm a co-producer of a sexy storytelling show called TP Confessions, uh, oh. which is our parent show is Bedpost Confessions out of Austin, Texas, a very, very uh, popular show there. Um, and we are doing that show three to four times a year in Edmonton and other cities. And we're about to launch our webpage, um, tpconfessions.com, and uh, we'll be coming to a city near you. So Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Is that, that sounds yeah. great. Is that that's something awesome. people can find online as well? Or is it only a live show? Uh, the show is live and mm-hmm. but we are like Bedpost Confessions does they have their own website we are going to start putting clips from our shows in sort of uh, like podcast format as well nice um, oh, great. yeah and we'll figure out where it goes I just got a big grant um, in Canada to to produce the show and build an arts based research lab around it oh awesome yeah yeah Very so cool. it'll it'll it's uh it'll it'll get even bigger and better excellent so, wonderful excellent yeah. All right. Well, thank you again so much for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge today, Kim. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. If you want to get in touch with us, you can send an email to info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can also leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-0-5, or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. To support our show and join our private Facebook community and discourse server, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hi, I'm Marla Marie Dean, author of Behind Closed Doors, and you're listening to a Swingset podcast on swingset.fm. Mm-hmm.